Hello, my name is Dr. Marla Dubinsky, and I'm going to bring you the key insights from the great debates and updates in inflammatory bowel disease meeting that was held here in Dallas. And I'm here with Dr. Thamos Disopoulos, who's one of the course directors, who comes from Baylor University Medical Center at Dallas. Great, thank you for having me, Marla. So what I thought we'd do today is we're just gonna kind of go through the meeting and maybe share with our listeners uh, and our viewers some of the key insights that both you and I took away from the different aspects of the meeting. We started the day in the morning talking about transitions. Uh, transition of care predominantly, there was also some transition through different aspects of life, but we'll focus on transition of care and thinking about what are the key elements that will improve the transition. So from me sending as a pediatric gastroenterologist, sending what I think think is a child who's ready to be transitioned to adult management or someone who I'm sending from New York to who's going to school in Texas. What are the specific elements that you feel the pediatric gastroenterologist could help you help make that best transition for the patient? Um, you know, as you know, Marla, a transition is exactly that. It's, it's not a uh, sudden uh, change of, of physicians or location, but it's actually a process that takes probably, you, you have more experience in that than me, uh, months or years, mm -hmm. it's in the making. And, and, and you in the pediatric world and other pediatric gastroenterologists start that process probably ahead of time. So we're really dependent on the pediatric team to prepare the patient. Uh, beyond that, what I find helpful is, is a letter, um, a call, um, I, uh, definitely the outside medical records yeah. uh, for us to review so as to understand again the nature of the disease but also to get to know the patient, the family, issues that have surrounded the management of the patient. Um, I think it's really important for us to tailor the visit to um, like any other patient but even more so in that setting to the needs and um, specific issues in the minds of on the mind of the patient and the and the family. Um, it's definitely important to uh, have a pleasant uh, interview that uh, is not rushed. Um, uh, to be open, to give material, um, to also um, work with the staff in terms of telling them ahead of time who is coming today mm -hmm. and that this is a really critical time in their in their uh, illness experience and we really want to have that you never uh, you make only, you get only one chance to make a first impression and and so I think that um, listening actively sp spending plenty of time um, maybe switching more to a, a more compassionate um, less less on the adult business like mm -hmm. approach really trying to in our minds think of the um, compassion part of IBD is really important so one of the things you know historically um, transition or actually transfer which is what you were kind of getting to that transfer is that transaction where you take pediatric care provider and the patient now is in front of an adult care provider and you're asking that there's good medical documentation medical records so when the transfer occurs you have what you need to make sure that the transition is smooth because that is a very vulnerable time in an IBD patient's life right they go from a cocoon like not as much autonomous care um, profile uh, and support to all right you're now 18 and you all of a sudden are in charge of your disease so one of the things that Robin Sokolow uh, for from Cornell taught us is that one of our jobs as pediatric gastroenterologists is to start early you know start even at the age of 10 to 14 know your milestones there's a NASPGAN milestones um, document or checklist where it's kind of like between the age of 10 to 12 you do this between 12 and 14 you should be doing this and you know using age as a way to where you start educating and developing your patient getting them ready but one of the other things that we realize and Laura Kiefer who is also a guest speaker uh, at the meeting talks a lot about how resilient you are and noted that age is probably not the most important factor for a successful transition but more about how confident and knowledgeable the patient is about their disease. Because if we don't, as pediatric GIs, don't prepare the child and start giving them some autonomy in their care, it will impact how good you are at you know, managing that patient. 
and trying to explain that the parents as well, because we got the parent aspect and the caregivers, that we need to start distancing parents from the care and having the child kind of take the driver's seat, and that's on us. So I think we both agree that um, there has to be some give on both of our ends with the patient in the middle and using the behavioral health team to maybe make sure they're confident that they are educated about their medications, they know where the disease is, they know what they have so that they're not just sitting in front of you and going, I don't know, um, I'll check. Or, you know, we want them to have that power. So I think one of the teaching points for me about transition was that we need to do a better job as PSGIs to get them ready for the actual transfer of care. What, what mistakes have you seen adult gastroenterologists make? Um, what can, can you tell us we as adult gastroenterologists um, do better? Uh, because again, I think that you guys carry most of this uh, prep work yeah. and um, we sort of take it from there, but, but you know, I'm sure there, there are some steps that we can improve. So I think one of the things that the feedback I would get, for example, would be the office was hard to reach because you tend to, maybe some pediatricians' offices work a little bit differently. The volume is typically less, so maybe it's just the phone call back is not as quick, for example, or they can't get a hold of someone for a refill. Those, I think having a way that the patient knows how to get a hold of the team is important. For them not to land in the office and then say, we're gonna scope you because I don't know anything about your disease. There's a lot of patients that would be like, running away, right? And they'd be like, all he wanted to do was scope me. You told me, meaning to me as a pediatric gastroenterologist, that that's not going to be the first thing they want to do. So I think maybe, as you noted, just trying to get to know the patient and how autonomous they really are before thinking they must be autonomous because they're sitting in your chair. I think also the transition of uh, biologics is important because whenever you switch uh, physician, uh, they may be in a different uh, uh, insurance program and I think making sure that everything is set up so that there's no delay in, right. in, the, in the infusion of whatever biologic or in the filling of any prescriptions. You know, again, transitions are, are stages where there's a lot of confusion. Yeah. Who's going to prescribe this now and when? And um, I, I think that um, I definitely um, learned the same thing from Dr. Sokolow's uh, lecture today, that it's emotional intelligence, resilience, uh, knowledge of the illness that, um, uh, that are predictors of, of a successful transition and, and we should uh, continue on that uh, path uh, in, uh, as we take over the care uh, the, of, the, of the patient. You know, because we spend so much time getting them ready, so. Like yes, you said. Of course. Um, so, and a lot of that, and also Dr. Kiefer um, really emphasized the idea of resilience. And I think that's a, the way that we're approaching uh, patients. It's, she was very provocative. She said that if our outcome, meaning ours, should be not to, should be to treat to prevent depression and anxiety, not assume, not try and manage depression and anxiety. So, if we could kind of predict or use factors that actually predict which patients are, that's the target she says we should be trying to achieve, which is a nice provocative way of saying we need to look at maybe using positive psychology instead of focusing on are you depressed, are you anxious, why don't we give them a toolkit to be self-effective and self-manage. I think those tools should be um, taught to adult gastroenterologists. I think we uh, are less um, knowledgeable. Mm -hmm about these issues. Moreover, I, I don't think that frequently the adult GI office is set up yeah. in terms of an integrated model uh, when it comes particularly to psychological support. And so again, I think that uh, communication between the pediatric team and adult team is critical for children that have coping issues, psychiatric issues, family stressors, even more so in those in those patients. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, what I love about is that now we're going to get into all the clinical nitty gritty, which I believe is very important. But as we said at the meeting, is that if we don't manage all of the life cycle issues that we kind of keep separate and focus only on the medical management, we're missing at least 50% of the story, right, with these chronic diseases. We have the same experience yeah. in the adults. I mean, you know, to the extent that you're not aware of family stressors, financial issues, pain management issues, 
all of this is going to complicate the management of the disease. Uh, you have to treat the entire human being. So the key themes today in the clinical side of things, um, which maybe we'll take some clinical pearls that we'll share with the, with the viewers. Let's start with Ed Loftus' talk on skin manifestations and um, how we should be managing uh, when a patient comes in with, there's multitude of skin manifestations of IBD, but I think the one that generated the most discussion was when a patient who's on a TNF who gets a skin reaction, most of the time it was a psoriasiform eczema or dermatitis type on TNF, patients are doing well, but they're having a skin manifestation, and how do you approach it? Um, do you differentiate those that could be treated topically versus those that are a little bit more intense, and what is the next best approach to that patient? I, I think uh, it's a great question, and it has to do with also our stewardship of medical therapies because we don't have an unlimited number of medical therapies and and this is a classic example of successful medical therapy which on the other hand has some issues associated with it so typically um, uh, I think that practice and and published uh, experience bear out the fact that most of these patients can be managed successfully by a dermatologist so um, that's what I will do I will uh, refer the patient to a dermatologist, preferably uh, someone who has experience in this. And I think that with topical therapies, um, in, especially in mild to moderate uh, uh, cases, these patients are able to continue on therapy um, uh, and manage at the same time the, 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 the skin manifestations. So I think, yeah, I think what he was kind of selling us is that if it's manageable by topicals, with the partnership of the dermatologist, have them see the dermatologist, then you stay on course. If it's associated with, for example, alopecia or significant secondary infections in the scalp um, lesions, and obviously that's very distressing to a lot of our patients, then he basically was teaching us that moving to another TNF is probably not the right move. And one of the things he was suggesting that this may be, now that ustekinumab is available, that may be a good niche window for where that therapy for Crohn's would be effective. And so I think one of the most controversial um, points for which you and I actually debated, which was maybe heated, which combines with another debate on therapeutic drug monitoring, is this whole idea of how do we optimize biologic therapy? Do we need a concomitant immunomodulator like we've been taught forever, especially since Sonic for seven years ago? Is there new information to say, if we had to tell the audience, in the current state of data, which is what you kind of taught me today, was that, you know, today, Marla, this is what we have. What would you tell the audience about the role of uh, combination therapy, how long, what's really the, the role of combination therapy, and do we have alternative ways of approaching that problem? Um, again, that, that is a common clinical uh, dilemma. Uh, combination therapy I is uh, the most effective therapy, but carries uh, a risk of, uh, particularly with the use of thiopurins, the risk of uh, EBV lymphoma and um, a type of lymphoma that uh, affects uh, young people who are EBV negative and have a primary EBV infection. Um, again, combination therapy appears to be, uh, it is uh, more effective than monotherapy um, in, as induction. Right. Uh, in approaching induction of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. The data um, are that there are no more infections with combination therapy, and probably in that short span of time, there, there's no greater incidence of malignancies. Now, the, the data are far muddier when it comes to maintenance therapy, and, and of course, um, the longer you are on, th on therapy, the, the higher the cumulative risk of mm -hmm of uh, various uh, neoplasms, for example, skin cancers or, or lymphoma. Um, and, and what I learned today from you is that the, the uh, benefit, the incremental benefit of uh, combination therapy uh, over anti-TNF monotherapy, it basically derives from the optimization of the anti-TNF pharmacokinetics um, via the use of the uh, immunomodulator. 
And so if there is another way to optimize the, the anti-TNF pharmacokinetics, then why not do so uh, and therefore avoid the risk of uh, lymphoma? And so I think you, you are a part of a group and you lead a group uh, that is looking at pharmacokinetics in, 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 uh, in the early stage of treatment and how adjustments in the infliximab dosing can be just as effective as combination therapy in that setting. You want to talk to us about, yeah. about, about that? I mean, you bring up what I liked that you also said is, you know, we're looking at it. And I think one of the things you brought up um, was that we really need to compare the gold standard best induction with combination thiopurine plus uh, TNF versus optimized TNF from minute one, meaning from the minute you enter on a TNF and you're using, uh, we're looking at using a pharmacokinetic model where it's literally a PK model using Bayesian modeling, which sets its stage on a priori, meaning what it should be doing, and then you add in the patient-specific variables and the model readjusts and says, oh, for this patient, you should use 10 milligram per kilogram every five weeks because it actually down to the milligram per kilogram based on body mass index, CRP, albumin, height, weight, uh, disease activity, and presence or absence of antibodies, as well as the drug level that the patient was able to achieve. So we're looking at looking we're looking at using that early, meaning in the induction phase. It's interesting. So the model you just described it it contains all the uh, factors that we know already to affect infliximab pharmacokinetics. Were there any other parts of the model that was surprising that appear that entered the model uh, that were beyond known factors? Uh, BMI, gender, uh, use of immunomodulator. Uh, well, in this case, you're not using the immunomodulator. W was there was there any additional uh, thing you you learned? The albumin is the most is the thing that influences most PK, but. If you put it in order, albumin and then the drug level. So without the drug level, it doesn't perform as well. So that's, I think, the point is that if you get a drug level early, my point, I guess, in the debate was that maybe you can negate having to use a, an immunomodulator if you would just optimize in induction your biologic monotherapy. So I think that is an interesting next step in, in our uh, research. And what you told us is basically this, in that, in that early setting with a high inflammatory burden of disease, you, you do use a little bit more infliximab exactly to optimize yep. the pharmacokinetics, uh, but in the long term, you actually come out even or even better. Cost-wise, it's even better, to be honest, and the exposure mm -hmm. is basically the same. I mean, if you looked at total exposure over a year, because we were able to de-escalate a lot of patients in the maintenance. Well, I, all I can say is if that is uh, borne out, um, if we can get more data out, then I think we're going to see a dramatic shift uh, because, um, because it will be really a, a paradigm shift um, in the management of, of Crohn's disease and UC. And we also talked briefly that with the newer biologics, which is also a paradigm shift, like vetalizumab or ustekinumab, the preliminary data we have suggests that the anti-drug antibody rates are much lower than the TNF, so it could be that, that those adoption of those therapies may also reduce the need for combination immunomodulator. Yeah. Having said that, we don't want to be abs absolute. Yeah. Uh, you know, we know that uh, the thiopurins and methotrexate have a role to play, particularly in the maintenance of, of steroid-induced remission. Um, but again, I think we're, we're, we're seeing a shift under our feet, of, the ground is shifting under our feet in terms of uh, old therapies, uh, what we've learned about them and, and new therapies coming in. So I don't think that thiopurins and methotrexate are, are gone, but they're certainly it's changing. beyond middle age. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Um, so let's just end with kind of, I want your take. You were involved in the last debate that we're going to mention, which is this idea of do we treat to symptoms or do we treat to the mucosa? I think we all believe fundamentally that if you achieved complete mucosal healing, a Crohn's patient will have less surgeries. I think Absolutely. a UC patient would have less colectomy, right? That's not up for debate. Can we get there in the current treatment strategies we have and at what cost. And you were passionate about that, so maybe share a few uh, thoughts on that. Well, we've already incorporated endoscopic healing in our practice. 
I mean, whether we like it or not, we've been uh, influenced by the dramatic, uh, or the significant rather, um, uh, endoscopic healing results of combination therapy. And so we're already um, uh, using very effective therapy. Uh, we're not using the old paradigm of steroids, aminosalicylates. But we know drugs that have now very limited role in the management of Crohn's disease. So the, 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 the standard of care is, is really risen and we, many of us are following hemoglobin, albumin, uh, CRP, uh, etc. So um, the question is, taking the patient you just described, the patient you're already optimizing um, with combination therapy or even better with um, uh, uh, model uh, uh, predicted uh, or model dictated uh, dose changes, uh, and in this patient, you don't end up with endoscopic healing. Then what do you do? So I, I think that um, you know, I'm, I'm, everybody's in agreement that multiple studies have shown a reduction of of colectomy uh, need for steroids, and you see multiple studies have shown the same thing in Crohn's disease: reduction of hospitalizations, surgeries, steroid exposure. There is no question about that. Um, but I think over time we've become so 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 good at treating the disease that incremental changes, uh, incremental improvements need um, perhaps new drugs. Um, yeah. and uh, perhaps a higher cost. So uh, that's something we need to, 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 uh, to look at. So I'm, I'm all for mucosal healing. Um, I, I just think that, um, you know, when you work in a, in a tertiary referral center and you see uh, patients who come in with uh, 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 optimally dosed drugs uh, and they have a little bit of residual disease, then what do you do yeah. with them? I think you're right. So I think um, our discussion really brought out kind of the key points that we wanted to share with the viewers. And um, in addition to these discussions, we also talked about new therapies, which will be exciting coming out. Uh, hopefully towards the end of the year, we'll have tofacitinib and uh, the future remains bright. So um, I hope you enjoyed our discussion about the key insights. Uh, from the great debates and updates in inflammatory bowel disease, and I'd like to thank Famos for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you.